we need to break in on our 24-hour coverage of the ladies' beach volleyball and take you over to the weight room where there is potential history in the making. That's right, Bob. We have a rookie contestant in the controversial event known as the Corvette Front End Snatch. I've seen this attempted only once previously, many, many years ago. It was attempted unsuccessfully by a man named Nalf Rader in 1966. Rader, also an American, only succeeded in getting the bar as far as his hips into what is known as the death lift position. Later, during a press conference, Rader stated categorically that if anyone attempted to reach the full Corvair snatch position, dead is just exactly what they would be. Jayhawker, an unknown name to the world, has come down a long, hard road to get here today. It's right, Bob. He comes all the way from Kansas, which anyone has to admit is a long, hard road. Now we see him, rubbing coal dust on his hands. You've got to have a good grip. It's right, Bob. Just look at that physique. You can tell he's trained hard for this moment. We see him here, dressed in peculiar costume. It is the traditional outfit of his ancestors, who were engaged in any general form of weightlifting. It's right, Bob. His ancestors were of the Baltic Sea region in northern Germany, whose creed was, if you can't borrow it from a cousin, who needs it? I must admit, I do like it. I sat down with Jay earlier today, and he expanded on the subject with a quote from his dear old grandmother. I quote, Clothes cost bucks. A little humiliation is free. Unquote. Such concentration, such focus, can he do it? That's right, Bob. He can do it. He's done it. He's done it. Just look at him celebrate. This is a moment that will live in the hearts and minds of Americans for generations. It's right, Bob. Sorry, Mr. Raider. Let's go back to replay and take a look at that unorthodox form. That's right, Bob, but perhaps it's his secret to success. Congratulations, Jayhawker, the new world record holder for the Corvair front end snatch. And now, back to the ladies' beach volleyball! Kid you not, I was dumping this out, and a lighter came out of the cross member. Gosh, those mice. Now I started out using the, oh whatever that is, 5 or 10 gallon media blaster there, and it works good. You know, I've done all this with it, and you get it done in short order, but I just never enjoy using it because I always feel like I can't control it as well as I would like to. It just hoses that media through there so fast, and it, it seems like it goes from not coming out to just a whole lot coming out and I can never find adjusted enough and uh, so once again I think I'll switch to my little 
spot blaster. I really enjoy using that thing because you can really um, you can really get good control and you know the only downside is you constantly have to refill it but I am cheap enough that that's a uh, small price to pay for not going through so much media that you just waste in this circumstance when you're not using a blasting cabinet. So I think I will dump that out to the bucket and start using it in here and uh, then to get this then we'll start in on the little all the control arms and the springs backing plates drums so forth and then we'll paint it well by the way I am using the black diamond coal slag I love using this stuff it's my favorite I get it at tractor supply and I buy the red as you can see the red bag is the fine the black bag is the coarse at least that's what uh, tractor supply stocks. So I really like using this stuff. So I decided to try something different other than sandblasting or wire wheeling everything. You know, something that works for you while you're doing something else. So I'm going to try um, removing the rust with citric acid on all the smaller pieces. And you know, there's various things you could use. You could use vinegar and you could use muriatic acid and there's just a wide range. Do your own research. You know, I did mine, but anyway. All I could find locally, and this would be in your canning section if you're at a grocery store or farm and home store or Walmart or whatever, um, but all I could find was a five ounce spice type bottle. Um, I'm sure you can order it online in bigger quantities for cheaper. This was about $4 um, or go to a bulk food store. I bought two of these, no idea of ratios. I'm going to start with one and uh, see how that gets me. Mmm, tangy. Um, same stuff if you buy a fruit flavored pop or candy. This is the same stuff that's in that. It burns! Ow, oh, help me! Oh, I'm fine. First part to go in is lower control arm. All I did was just scrape the big chunks off. So we'll see. Well, I might need a little more water yet. Okay, just in case somebody else out there is interested, let's talk about this just really briefly. Um, I'm going to try not to bore you to death, but just as a comparison to like a, a commercial rust remover like Evaporust. Um, Evaporust, I'm a fan of it. That's great stuff. The downfall is it's expensive. Okay, I mean it, it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't emit a gas. Um, like muriatic acid, that strips metal down fast, but it's dangerous to work with, emits a gas inside, you don't really want to be using it inside, and it etches your metal, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Like this spindle, I wouldn't have put that in muriatic acid, um, because that would eat away at that surface. So. Um, I ended up putting both bottles in, so 10 ounces total in 5 gallons of water. Um, and I'm so encouraged by the results, I actually got on eBay and ordered 5 pounds of the stuff 
for $18, okay? And I have this sitting overnight, and first thing in the morning, so about 12 hours, I would say, roughly. Um, when I do it again, I am going to put probably five ounces per gallon of water. So running the numbers, um, a five pound bag for 18 bucks, that's 23 cents an ounce. And if I put 25 ounces or five of these total in five gallons, that'd be $5.75 worth of citric acid in a five gallon bucket. Compare that to Evaporust, you'd spend about $80 per five gallons. Now, Evaporust you can use again and again until it is completely loaded up with rust. I don't know where the threshold is there to where it's unusable um, and I don't know where the where an unusable <laughs> when citric acid in water turns unusable. I have to find all this out. This is new to me too. There on the lower control arms you see the difference. Since this is very diluted, you know, only 10 ounces of acid in the bucket. I'm going to run that again and the spring again. Um, what was towards the top didn't quite, you can see the difference on this side compared to this side. But otherwise, I mean, that's clean metal, perfectly clean metal. Very encouraged by the results. Anywhere where there's black is grease that I didn't get off. So that can that will easily be cleaned off. But for what it's worth, there it is. I'm encouraged by the results. I think it'll work out great. I think in the future I might get a big plastic tote and you can just submerge all kinds of stuff in that. So there we go. So if you know me by now, you will know my disdain for buying parts unnecessarily, especially personally, my personal projects. So I want to check out these tie rod dens. I mean, they feel nice and tight, but I want to flush them out with grease and see if they loosen up any. If they do, I'll replace them. This one's got a broken zerk, so we're going to see if we can back that out. Now they make some handy tools for these things. Kind of a four-way deal. You have your elbow zerk, straight zerk sockets, a little easy out, and a thread chaser. There's two different sizes there. The easy out doesn't grab on this one, unfortunately. So what did I do with the wrench? No, 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 no.
Okay, well, as far as the left side tie rods go, we're good to go. Don't need to buy those. Um, now, I am going to just wire wheel everything as well as I can. I don't want to immerse this in anything, and I don't want to media blast this, obviously, and just get a whole bunch of junk down in there. So, just going to do the best I can with that, and then we'll paint them, put new boots on them, grease them, and we're good to go. And I'm also going to do the same, same operation with the upper ball joint, but I can tell you right now the way it feels, both of them are good. So the only actual joints I've had to replace, lower ball joints. And then I need to check out the, let's see, did the idler arm have? Then I'll need to check out the idler arm also. Um, it doesn't have greasable joints as far as that goes but we'll make sure those are good they feel nice and tight but then again you got to consider this thing's been sitting for many many years so Okay, looking a whole lot better. Um, yeah, once I degrease this, clean it up, and we'll mask off these so we don't get paint down in there, and we'll just paint them. Now, don't think I'm being an advocate for everyone doing it this method. Like I've already stated, this is my own personal car, and when one of these wears out, no big deal for me to replace one. Um, and if uh, Somebody out there is just saying, hey, you tool, replace them. You know, you're there. Well, once again, don't want to spend the money if I don't have to. If I have perfectly good vintage parts that I believe were made better, then I'm going to reuse them. I see no sense in spending money I don't have to spend on my own personal vehicle. So how about you do it your way, I'll do it mine, and I'm pretty sure we'll all survive. Now, if any of you are rebuilding a car and you have any questions or doubts about any of your joints being worn out, just replace it. So you may remember from the previous video how wavy, well you can see how wavy that is, how beat up it is from guys prying the drums off with pry bars instead of doing it the right way. I don't know who does this stuff. But you did, Mr. Wells. So to fix that problem, I'm using my brake lathe completely wrong, but as long as the result is right, that's all I care about, I guess. I don't know. And we're going to fix that edge. You know, no one will ever see it again except me, and uh, that will be very, very rare, but we might as well fix it.
So that seemed to work pretty good. Take a look at it. A little bit of chatter on there, but I can smooth that out with the sander. More importantly, nice and straight along the edge now. Well, it didn't want to press out. I got it to loosen up and move with the chisel, but the more I chisel, the more I'm beating up my control arm. So, You naughty little thing. So I was able to get both bushings out, finally. Um, got a lot of cleanup to do. The second one I got out only with the air chisel. I was able to knock the shaft out and then I could really get in there a whole lot better with the air chisel and push that out. But I've noticed that working on the press has collapsed this control arm. Um, there are several ways we could do this but I think I can just spread it back out with my vise. We'll try it anyway. I need eight and an eighth inches outside to outside where the bushings go here so what just happened to my vice clip came out well that's handy
So even though it's a Wilton, it is the cheapest Wilton Vice money can buy, I'm sure. I mean, I wouldn't have bought anything else. Um, so there's a spring, a washer, and that E-clip. And trying to put force spreading out, you know, obviously it's not made for that. And it just put all the force on that E-clip and spread it out. And then you got no more, no more movement. Incidentally... A Matco DTG 170 is an that's a uh, window crank tool for like GM cars to pop the little clips off for the window crank. That makes a great little tool for uh, holding all that in there. In case you know someone else out there actually does things like I do. So out of the frying pan and into the fire. Got a very sketchy operation going on here. I've got these little. Press dogs, that one's not even tight. We'll just, you know, scoot it under there. Holding this side, got an old, looks like an old break, broken breakover handle. Going down through, piece of scrap iron. Actually, it's an old hatchet blade I just had laying here. To block off the bottom hole, and I'm pushing on it with the handle, spreading those out. Don't do what I do another eighth of an inch and I know it's going to spring back on me. So I'll probably go to eight and a quarter and see how far back it goes. It's eight and an eighth. There's eight and a quarter. Let's see how far back she goes. Quite a ways. We're only at eight, just another quarter or eighth of an inch to go. I think that'll do it. Okay, there you can see I've got it bent back the dimension it should be and had I been smart before I ever tried pressing these I would have cut a piece of scrap iron to span this to pre prevent that from happening I will definitely do it on this one and uh, then I can avoid this inconvenience but we're gonna get this bad boy cleaned up I'll be another piece ready to paint. Just got the uh, wheel bearings cleaned up and all the really greasy stuff. And just looking them over, and I see absolutely no issue with these. Good old American-made bearings. If they were pitted, discolored, anything like that, uh, certainly replace them. But these are good to go. All right, if you let me play Barbara Walters real quick, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Um... So I've been soaking stuff in citric acid, as you very well know, and I just wanted to show a comparison of different stages and different things. This obviously has not been touched. That's the right-hand coil. By the way, there's the left-hand coil right out of the acid. Nothing else been done to it. Looks pretty good. This tie rod assembly has just been wire wheeled. I told you that was all I was going to do to it because I didn't want acid getting down in there. Um, you know, it looks very typical of wire wheeling something. Wherever it's shiny metal is where it was coated with grease. And wherever it's brown, that is just your typical steel color that was rusty and uh, after cleaning it off with the wire wheel. 
This is just acid and then wiped down with lacquer thinner. Nothing else. I actually um, allowed that to flash rust just lightly. It wasn't too bad, but I had to take it out. I dried it off with an old rag and I left it alone. Not really something I would like to do all the time, but um, that's what that looks like. And then this is acid dipped and then wire wheeled very quickly. I mean, it took me no time at all. And that looks, looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, so here's the one from the right hand side and the left hand side. Very little time and energy spent on that. So there you have it. These are the results that I'm coming up with just as I'm learning to use it myself. I have not used citric acid previously, but I'm really liking it. Um, time will tell, you know. I'm going to keep using it, definitely. Uh, and by the way, I do not know effects of it on your skin. It does not burn me in that weak concentration that I've been using so far. Like I said, I am going to step that up and make it more powerful. Um, I would definitely recommend, you know, if you just dip your hands in it and arms like I've been doing, rinse them off at the least. And I like to wear gloves. I found out when I pull this stuff out of the acid and I'm cleaning it, um, it's good to wear gloves because your skin gets absolutely stained black with the residue. So that's what I know. Now when it comes to the drums, you know, that's an item you're just not going to see much of once the wheel's installed. And even if you crawl underneath the car and try to look, maybe at most you'll see the sidewall of it. But I still like to try to get some paint on there just to keep it from rusting. Keep them a little nicer. Sometimes I spray them with um, cast iron gray engine enamel. That looks good and it just keeps what you're seeing right now. It just keeps that look. But this time around I think I'm going to stay with the low gloss black duplicolor engine enamel with ceramic up to 500 degrees because as you should know by now that that's going to get hot. So um, yep, we're just going to spray it. So 80 years ago, if a guy was talking about a classy chassis, well, he could have been talking about a car or a woman. Sometimes it was hard to tell. Sometimes both. Anyway, I'm sorry to disappoint a lot of you guys, but we're going to stick with the car aspect on this video. I think I just lost half of you, but come on back. Anyway, a guy has a lot of options these days of what to paint the undercar pieces. 20 years ago already I was using POR15, P-O-R-1-5, paint over rust to the 15th power. And I still know where those cars are, and the frames and the axles and everything I used that product on still look great to this day. Or a guy could uh, go to a company like Eastwood and get their own special formula. You could just get epoxy paint and primer, that would do a good job. Um, if you really wanted to get serious and flip the bill for it, I suppose, you could have it powder coated. Um, I'd really like to get set up myself for powder coating, but I, I have no place to put it and I have no money to buy it. So, what I'm going to do is kind of an old school method for parts that were put in harm's way. This was used a lot on wheels back in the day. Um, First of all, I'm do, using a rust coat primer. Just get that down and all the hard to reach cracks and all the welds and everything. And that should take care of any tendency for stuff to rust on me. And then to go with that, I'm using Rust-Oleum enamel. I'm a big fan of Rust-Oleum. Semi-gloss black, 
15 bucks a quart. Um, but back in the day, guys would paint their wheels and enamel forms a harder coating and a more durable coating, I should say, than a lot of your other paints, especially old school paints. And uh, they just use that a lot. So that's what I'm gonna do. It's cheap, it's easy, it's durable. And keep in mind, this will end up far better than anything the factories would have been bothered with back in the day. They were just trying to get it out the door. And it's not like I'm gonna go mudding with the thing or, you know, consider how you use a restored car. Maybe you'll get caught in the rain, maybe it'll get dirty down a gravel road, but for the most part, anything you do is gonna hold up just fine. Somehow I managed to miss the fact that this was red and not gray. That's what I thought I was buying. Not that it matters much. Wow, that was awesome. All right, that's where I'm gonna stop with that, at one coat. I don't wanna get things too thick. And actually, I'd originally planned only on doing the big things, the cross member, the control arms, the backing plates. I wasn't gonna bother with the steering stuff, the small bits, just paint those black, but I only mixed 12 ounces for the gun and I covered everything with it, so that's okay. Be a little more, more protected. Um, so we're just going to let this cure, clean out the gun, and we'll come back with the black. And I have to find a better way to hang that because I can't see the bottom. And I want to paint it all at one time. I don't want to, you know how slow Rust-Oleum dries. I don't want to take two days painting one little thing. So. Just to be proactive and answer any questions ahead of time, this gun is a DeVilbus finish line. And I have the uh, D-cups system with it. And basically it just keeps it a whole lot cleaner, a whole lot easier. You don't have to clean a cup out. Just 
toss it away. I haven't even looked. I bought the whole system several years ago and I haven't even looked lately um, if you can still. I assume that all is still out there, the consumables. Um, I bought a whole box of cups and lids and so I haven't gone through them, but I do like it. As you can see, I've rearranged things here. I'm almost running out of shade. Put my cross member on my sky hook. Whoop. One of these can be yours for just $150,000. Order now, you might get it in three to five years. Wow! So I was able to sort my left hand, my right hand stuff, and I need to wipe off that strut rod because I, you probably saw I dropped it in the wet grass as I was painting it. So. Anyway, let's get to work. Alright, everything is looking pretty good. Kieran nice and halfway glossy like we want it to. An added benefit of using Rust-Oleum is of course if you missed a little spot you can just throw some enamel spray paint on it. I'm gonna leave this just sitting hanging out here most of the day, let it cure nice and hard. Um, we're gonna go back in the shop clean up a few other things but you know I think it's about 10 o'clock and you know what that means that's the first of three Dr. Peppers for the day
How to make rusty, nasty old bolts beautiful again in three easy lessons. Step one, clean rust from bolt using acid or media blaster. Step two, wire wheel etch surface the bolt to a brilliant sheen. Step three, irritate your friends and family by posting a picture of your bolt on social media. Or perhaps make a stupid video and put it on YouTube. Well, it is looking pretty good in here. So are the car parts. Anyway, um, we have got everything cleaned, painted, ready to put back together. We've got the brake drums turned. They're looking good. Why am I telling you all this? Because you just watched it? I don't know. Anyhow, I've got a lot of the parts on order. Everything that was rubber was either dried out or cracked. So bushings will be replaced, dust boots will be replaced, wheel cylinder kits, seals, anything like that is, is going to be brand new because I'm pretty sure it was from 62 yet. Now the brake hardware, I was kind of leaning towards trying to clean it up and reuse it. You kind of take a chance there because those springs do break. Um, but all my usual methods of getting parts uh, were, just wasn't coming up with anything. Clark's Corvairs up in um, the Northwest, they had kits and there's an outfit in California that also had them. Um, but they run $40, $50. And I, just kind of a last resort. I punched in 62 Corvair in Napa's online store and it didn't come up with kits but it came up with individual springs and components. So I kind of put my own kit together on their website and ordered it and ended up getting enough stuff for all four wheels for about $35, $40 plus shipping. So that's about what you would pay for a normal kit for just an, any any common car. So that worked out okay. Now I have a lot more hardware to get through to clean up in the tumbler, the wire wheel, you know, whatever we can do, we're going to do it. And then and then the next video is going to be a big one. We're going to put brakes together, rebuild the cylinders all the suspension and steering. This thing is going to be complete once again by the next video. So thanks a lot for watching guys. Had a lot of fun. I really enjoy making old junk look new again. My heart, my mind, and my soul rebel at asking you guys to do things like subscribe to this channel I'm disgusted with myself already. But thanks a lot for watching. God bless you guys. See you next one. Would stand up. They tried to make the Corvair roll over. It wouldn't. They locked the wheels, so it had to roll over.